Pat says, um, where do I find these weekly recorded sessions for each week? Uh, having a lot of problems typing as I recently broke the little finger on my left hand. I'm sorry to hear that, Pat. That's a shame. Okay, so many of the webinars are archived right here on Power Options. Underneath the main home tab, go to free webinars. This is actually a public page, poweropt.com slash webinars.asp. There we go. So you can access that without even being logged in. So you see here, there's a variety of sections. Power Options Tools, we have some recent webinars for tools for rolling covered calls and finding covered calls. Strike of Pain, the pinning tool. Uh, new Option Detail Tarts, five minutes on the stock repair tool. You go further down, you've got older webinars for using the Power Options Search tool. Using the More Information buttons to further research and analyze a stock or an option. How to use the Portfolio Tools to enhance your trading, and much more. Under the Option strategy sections, now, the first five that appear, one, two, three, four, five, these are for subscriber access only. These are the most recent ones. So as I start uploading more strategy discussions, you'll start to see more. But as a trial member, just scroll down. So you have the scroll bar here. There's probably over 30 strategy webinars listed here. You're just not seeing the most recent ones if you come to the free page not being logged in if you're currently on a trial. But... You see here, good candidates for poor man's covered call. Four questions on iron condors. Go down a little bit further and we get into the real sort of education, meaning 101. So you've got credit spreads, the basics. Credit spreads beyond the basics, part one. Uh, eight ways to manage a bull put credit spread. Calendar spread criteria, calendar spread basics. Managing covered call positions. Straddles and strangles for earnings. Selection criteria for buying options and managing your long or bought options positions, naked puts, managing your naked puts, and so much more. Under the concept section, again, the first five are blocked out if you're not logged in as a subscriber. You know, here's some of the information we're talking about. Is now the right time to buy VIX calls using bankruptcy indicators. Um, here's one from a couple years ago. Do 85% of options traders lose money? And there's several more. Weekly options, basics and preferred strategies. Manage your broken position, options, exercise versus assignment. And then the requested topics. Okay, so here's where some of the Friday ones are. A couple weeks ago, unusual option volume and SPX options, the portfolio tools and rolling and in the money covered call, and more. I don't post all of the sections on the Friday series that I cut up um, and, and turn into videos here on Power Options because a lot of those topics are already covered in a more comprehensive webinar that's already been posted. Yeah, I know, I should update more and keep more recent ones here, Pat. But the other key is anytime, go to YouTube and then just search for Power Options or go to Power Options there. Click on the videos. And so here are all the ones from last Friday. The, the last four sections here, these were all from last Friday. Calculating returns on a calendar spread, four options investing topics in under 30 minutes. Don't have my notes with me, so I forgot which four those was. They were um, setting technicals for higher volume and average. Uh, the delta ratio uh, for William and debits and credit spreads was included in that. Uh, Brent's comment on searching for iron condors on indexes and William's other comments on two-week out bear calls related to bull puts. In the money strangle versus married puts and specific management ideas on the bear call, bull put, and a long call. And then from another week ago, here's four more webinars, Theta Decay Managing. So as you can see, I crop out this conversation of been lasting an hour and a half or so to six o'clock, as I mentioned. So I crop out these into 20, 25, sometimes 30 minute presentations. The first section of this one, where we're gonna talk about um, the market sentiment tool, the fundamentals, and uh, some of the other comments that came in was actually about 35 minutes long. Once we started at about uh, three, three, uh, 438, to went to about 501, I believe, somewhere in that time frame. Okay, so that's where you can find all these videos on the webinars page, public page, powerop.com/webinars.asp, and on YouTube you can find all of them. And the reason why, again, some of them aren't posted directly on Power Options is I already have, for example, a full discussion on looking at in the money debit spreads and debit spreads versus credit spreads. This is a good 19-minute segment. It was a great question but the full discussion that goes more in depth than we could have in that 20 minute discussion is already posted on the website on that credit spreads versus debit spreads discussion. Uh, managing a losing long put, this is a 32 minute discussion. 
but a lot of that's included the existing webinar on the webinars page, managing your long options positions, long calls and long puts, talks about both sides, managing if it's losing, managing if it's winning. Still an extremely useful video and a great question that came in. But the full video on managing long options is already here in the option strategies section. Yes, it's five years old, but it's 93% of the same content I would present today, would just be using more recent examples, which is never a bad idea to do. So you have a mix of both there as well. All right, so that's where you find the webinars, Pat. Okay, so let me get to Pat's other question because that was first. On 7-8, and of course I see all the other questions coming in. Uh, we'll get to all of them, don't worry, we'll be right there. Uh, AGQ was the position you bought 100 shares at 31.15 so on 7.8. I should read the rest of your question before I just start typing things in. Okay, and then, there it is, Pat. You sold to open a 35 call for 146. You bought to close the call at 1599 and sold a call at 1677. Lost I got behind on the increase in price for AGQ, would not be unhappy to sell stock, but not sure if I get a little more money in the next few weeks for 918. Okay, so I think your expiration was at 918, but let's take a look here. You had sold the, it's at 49.92. We'll just assume you sold the August 35 first. Okay, and you got 146 for it. All right, so this is a conversation that we've had recently about rolling deep in the money covered calls. Now, you're originally looking at a fantastic return of 17.9% here, and it gapped up. Okay, but so what you did is you rolled the call, and you said that you bought it back. Maybe you did August, too. I'm not sure. Well, you can't do August. You bought it back. Okay, I'm sorry, sorry folks, 15.99 and sold to open 35 at 16.77. Okay, all right. Okay. <clears throat> so bought it back one for 15.99. So before I do anything further, where do we stand? Well, now I stand on a position where I've got a cost basis of 45.68 on a stock trading at 49.92. And now you mentioned that you sold again. I'm assuming you had to roll it. Maybe you rolled, you probably rolled, i sorry, you rolled from July to August. And uh, now you're, I guess, in the August 35 call. Okay, but so what I was going to suggest in this case is, is rather than keep the 35 call, you rolled up and out to August and got a $16 1677 from 1599. So you essentially increased your return by 77 cents from what you're expected to make. And we saw it was a very high return in that case. So in this case, let's just take this. Where would we stand now? So subtracting all that out, 4568 was the cost basis. I'm going to add the August back in. Let's say you rolled from July to August. And that's where you got the 1677. And you said you've got a few weeks to September. So that doesn't matter in this case. Because what I want to show you, is you increased your return by about 4%. That's pretty good. Remember, we were looking at about 17.9%, and now it's up to about 21% with the buyback cost of the original call, putting your cost base up to 4568. This is where the position stands right now. You probably potentially could have gotten a higher return, but you would have rolled for a debit if you roll to the higher strike. So if I went to maybe the 40, I know it doesn't have as much premium, and this thing is apparently moving and you're worried about it falling back down, it's an ultra silver ETF. Not probably gonna get the same price, but let's say I rolled up instead of the August 35, I went up to the August 40. Now at that time you say you got 1677, so this might have actually been 50 cents higher, so, so let's put that at 11, going up to the higher strike. Now this would have been rolled for a debit, not necessarily a credit. Why doesn't that look right to me? It actually lowered the return. I figured with going, five, you got 16.70. Oh, that's why, because you got 16.77. Okay, so this probably would have been closer to 12 if that was at 16.77. You see what I mean? It not necessarily would have increased it. Okay, 
So yeah, in this case, that actually still worked out pretty well. I think I'm just got, don't have the numbers right for what this 30, I'm sorry, the 40 strike call would have been because it might have been $5 less than the 35, but I doubt it. Um, you know, it was 1677, it would have been 1177. I can't imagine that would have been the case, that it would have been just an intrinsic difference between the two. The 40 call that's closer to that, the money would have had a higher time value, so this should have been above 21% if it was. Okay. So all I'm pointing out is, is that if you're in this position now with your 35 strike, whether it's August or September, my apologies, 35 strike, 1677, right? There you go. So that's where I think you are right now. Let me add it to the portfolio. And so you sort of asked, what can you do now to get some more premium out of it? Well, any premium extra you're going to get out of it is going to be by rolling the call again. You have to buy it back and roll it up. What are the opportunities? Well, this is why I use the portfolio tool. As I'm tracking any position, I go to position actions and then position analysis. This gives you a breakdown of the AGQ position, currently at a 21.1% return if assigned, uh, or 21.1 liquidation value right now. No, 20.6 liquidation. Max is 21.1, I apologize. You're at 97.9 of what you expected to make. And could I increase my 21% by rolling higher? Well, this does give you some opportunities where I can go up to 26% by rolling out to the September 40. But it's going to be done at a debit. I have to buy it back now at 1505 and I get 1240 for the September 40 call. That should take me up to 26.7%. Uh, if I go higher to the 43 strike, we can go up to 29% if assigned. So for an extra 30 days or keeping the same time frame, it's an increase of 8%. That's a pretty good move. But of course, all that is based on what do you think the stock is going to do next? If you think it's going to pull back, that the silver could take a hit and this could pull backwards in that case and drop back down to 39 or 38 it might not be a good idea to roll up to the 42 or 43 strike in that case. Yes, it still has a 68, 65% probability of being assigned. But again, if you think it's going to fall back, you're in a better position right now because you have the extra downside protection to the 35 strike as well. Okay. All right. Okay. So, but yeah, that if you wanted to get, yeah, that's where I'm probably saying it wrong, Pat. I just noticed your your other note. And uh, Sam adds, AGQ is at 53, 54. It might break the high recently. Um, Silver took a beating. You can see the charts. Uh, Sam says he's just adding and he thinks this was a good trade. So you had asked about premium, okay? And, you know, the warning here, of course, is that we know it's an ultra and it could fall. Sam mentioned that as well. But in this case, what I'm saying is you had mentioned rolling and you said getting more income. Well, what is income to you? I know what income is. <laughs> that. What is income to you? Do you mean income by trying to roll your call now to get a higher credit, meaning buying it back at 1505 and then selling this September 30 at 1607? Okay, so that would increase the credit by another dollar two and put you up to about a 25% return? Or is it okay for you based on your expectations to roll for a debit and increase the percentage gain if you are assigned by five, six, or seven percent for the next 29 days or so from where you are right now? Okay, what's most important, the end goal return or the premium generation? You've got a dollar gain in this, dollar 72 gain in this, you could buy it back now and still roll down to other strikes for higher premium to September and still increase your return and increase your downside protection. But that's not a bad idea. Don't get me wrong. These lower strikes, higher probability, still technically collecting more premium, increasing the percentage return for another 28 days from August to September in that case and increasing the downside protection. But is it okay to maybe lower the downside protection and increase the cost basis if you're increasing the net return by 6, 7, or 8% for an additional 28 days as well? All right. But this is what this tool will help you with in that case.
Okay, that's why it's important to track the positions in the portfolio to evaluate these rollout opportunities. Um, all right. I think I've got two or three William questions in a row, but I think before William, if I'm not mistaken, yep, before William is Edison. Edison was first here. Okay, and I think this is an easy question to answer as well. Uh, Edison says, hi Mike, do you recommend the married put on three times ETFs? I know you have spoken against this one in your past seminars, but I feel like this pricey initial put will be compensated for by greater volatility inflated prices of options that we could potentially sell in the future as part of income methods. I don't Edison, okay? I, I personally do not. You're absolutely correct. What does a three times ETF do? It means that normally when I look for a structure I'd want on a married put, I'm carrying a five to 8% risk on the position. Okay, we all know that with the married put structure. That's what I'm looking for with the standard search, what we teach in the blueprint, and the radioactive trading techniques and what I do with 50 to 60% of my portfolio. We see the range here of six to 7% risks for a controlled risk. And the idea is that I can use those income methods from the most simple of selling a call to using the put as a second adjustment, a second asset that works in my favor as the stock moves up and down, riskless spread trades that don't take on any margin because we own the stock, and so on and so forth, the 12 different income methods discussed in the blueprint. Selling the premium, the riskless spreads that I send, you're going to be getting a higher premium than I'd be expecting on JD.com, Dropbox, PPG Industries, PayPal, absolutely. But the problem comes with the three times ETFs, in my opinion, is that there are so many wild swings that it's hard to catch the income. Because remember, selling the call to help pay for the put for example, is based on getting the right premium to pay for that inflated put, but to not have the stock go above that strike price by too much, because now it costs me way too much to buy it back to try to roll, as we just sort of saw uh, with the discussion there on the covered call. Okay, Our risk is going to triple, but the premiums are triple as well, and that, that's sort of the thing. So let's try, let's just take TNA. Okay, and I'll go out probably March, maybe January, but I'm going to go March. So I want to go at least 150 days out in time, 231 days. These aren't that bad. This one's actually not that bad at all. So at a normal $29 stock, yeah, I'd probably be looking at the 30 to 35 strike. I'd hope they'd have a 32.50 or 33. My target here would probably be the 32.50 or 33 strike if it was available. But look, even at the 35 strike, it's 15% risk. It's double what I would normally take. 40 is at 10.9, 45 is at 8.9. We'll just take the 35 here, stock's at 29. So now as the stock moves up, is it going to be possible for me to start cutting down on this based on the high premiums that are available? Well, of course, right? 30, but remember, I got to start at 35, so I'm not looking at a lot of premium here in this case. This one seems less volatile than some of the other three times ETS, honestly, but that's okay. Let's see, what's the risk here now? So, yeah, I can't sell the 30 or the 32 and a half. A better example might have been to take the 30 strike and then look at a 30 or a 35 call. It's not a lot of good strikes here. But see, in this case, up to 35, the return max is 7.7%. That's a 14-day trade, so that's not too bad. We took down the risk to 12.3%, still double of what most of my positions are right now. And I'm not saying you would choose the 35 right away. You wouldn't do that. You'd wait for it to go up before selling it. But, I mean, you see where we are. I mean, this thing has dropped back down to 24 or 26. It's jumped as high as 35 before the big decline recently. This isn't actually a lot of movement I'd expect for a three times ETF, but that's okay. It's still looking pretty strong. To me, the risk isn't worth it. If the market goes south, this is a bullish three times ETF, of course, but if the market goes south against us, this thing could go back down to that 22, 23 range. Now I'm near the max profit, I'm sorry, the max loss of that 14 or 15 percent pretty quickly. I don't know if the volatility is going to help me with that um, as well. So in that case, I, I just don't recommend it personally. I think it's harder to track 
I'm sure there are other three times ETFs that have more of a wider change. Um, oh, we could probably just look at AGQ very quickly, see how that performed as uh, we were just talking about there. That was just an ultra, but not a three times. Not too much of a bounciness, but you know, extreme measures recently, ups and downs. Uh, Sam mentioned it had gone up to 54, pulled back down to 45. Now it's back up to that 49 range that we saw earlier. So quick, sudden moves. If this was a married put position and I was did the covered call here because it was moving up and I sold the 40, income method number one, that I'd have to roll it here, probably roll it to the 45, that I'd have to roll it again. You know, it might be in that position where we're staying here now or we rolled back down. That's the risk of the three times. It can still get away from you very, very quickly. All right. Okay. So let me just check comments below. Okay. Yeah, Sam did mention in one night it can go to 20 very fast. You just have to be careful with those as well. Um, three times big Katango, Fernando says, uh, in that case. Um, all right, so that's, that, that's just some of the concerns, Edison. That's why I do not recommend it. Uh, yes, you're getting more premium, but at the same time, you're also paying more for that risk. And the whole idea of the married put structure is, hey, I want to keep it to a controlled risk of 5 to 7%. So that if I keep my track record where it is, if I'm making an average of 7% on my winners when I'm right, only losing 4% on my losers when I'm wrong, and I'm right about 60% of the time, Ernie's 11% on his winners, about 5% on his losers, but he's right about 55% of the time. They're both winning track records for our goals. If I take those risks as high as 20% or 25%, now I need to see gains of 40%, 45%, and still be right 55 to 60% of the time, which is possible with the three times ETFs. But I could really handicap myself by selling a call with a high premium to try to pay off the high risk and missing out on this large movement, as we just saw with the AGQ covered call. Now I'm not taking advantage of that gain that I need to get closer to those 40% wins when I'm taking 15 to 20% losses as well. Okay, so maybe that's a good idea. Uh, William had mentioned TQQQ might have been a better example to use. I don't think we're going to go through that right now. If we have time later, we'll look at TQQ for that. Um, but it's just a, another one there also. Okay. That's right. And it, it's, it's the same. Yeah, TQQ is better volume, closer strikes, but still about a 10 to 15% risk. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's 5.45 p.m. Believe it or not, I think we've gotten through all of the questions. But if anyone does have any last-minute questions, send those in. We're going to enhance our discussion here a little bit. I'll probably crop this section out and add it with the other one. We're going to look at the married put on TQQQ. I'll stick with March because that was the example we used for TNA in this case. Oops. TQQ at 119. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to be at probably the 123 strike, which is an 18.3% at risk. Let's see here. Where's my range in the money? This is usually my threshold would be the 140. I never go beyond that, and that's 12.7%. To get the risk I want, I'd have to be 38% in the money. Okay, so I think a good wheelhouse here would probably be these two, the 130 or 135 with stock trading at 119. Uh, why do I say that? Because they're about 8 to 13% in the money. 21 might be a little bit high, but that's not bad. It's 11%. It's also 20% in the money. You can see that movement as we were talking about earlier as well. Let's just take the 135. on TQQ, and naturally, of course, I'm going to need for the stock to move up in this situation. Can we, do we have a good view of this? Hopefully we do. Ooh, we do. We do, we do, we do. Not bad. Let's go back to June 30th. Can I do that? I'm not going to be able to do that on this account, but that's okay. June 30th, when the stock was at around 90, or June 29th, the stock was around 90. Okay, so let's go back to the chain. Let's see what we can do here, shall we? Should be able to get back to June. Should be able to go back two months here on the trial. Yeah, good. June uh, 29th. I'm going to try the 29th. Okay. One second. <clears throat> okay. Okay. All right, so what essentially you can, well, that was strange. 
All right, so it's just trying to find the date here. It's loading the history. We're also uploading the history as well. In any case, um, what I wanted to do is probably March, but maybe January. Oh, was that 22? No, not, not 22. December, January, June. Oh, okay. The Marches weren't out yet. So let's go to January. All right, so what, naturally what I'm going to do is we're going to simulate getting into a married put at 92.34 for TQQQ. Looking at the puts here, knowing I have to go a little bit in the money. I don't think the 101 at 26.33 is going to cut it. Oh, actually it might. Let's just do the 100. I'll do, I'll do the 101 at 26.33. I don't know if I'm going to get much better than that. The 105 is looking pretty good at 28.63. Only $2 more for $4 more. Okay, 105, 28.63. All right, let me just jot this down. Okay. Perfect. So, now that we're at 119, Ninety-two thirty-four. I was looking at the Jans at that time. We were talking about the 101. Let's try the 101 first. And let's add the put instead of the call because that would look really weird. And at 2633 for the 101 strike. All right. Submit that. Yeah, so there we go. 14.9% risk on the position. Okay, three times ETF. Or ultra, yeah, ultra pro QQQ. Now we're at 119. What options do I have? Well, I could roll the put very easily, but let's see about just selling a call first. I've got to make up, I'm sorry, 1767. We want to be shorter term. Let's go August. Okay. All right. So here we are at 119. So 125 at 505. So again, that's about where's the problem? There's a problem here just noticed it. We talk about the preferred way to use income method number one. That income method number one should reduce the risk by at least a half to a third. We're close to a third at 500, but not really. This doesn't actually meet the requirements I'd use for income method number one. Yes, it's at 119 and I'm looking at the 130. Why am I looking at the 125? But even that might be too close for my taste because we know this stock could run. So what does happen when I sell that 125 call? Do I reduce the risk by five points? Absolutely. Am I selling a call above my put strike price? So I'm keeping a bullish position? Absolutely. I'm still carrying an 11% risk. Right? I only knocked the risk down by 3.5%. Now the return, yes, is 22.9, but I've got a lot of that just in the underlying from 92 to 119. <laughs> that's it's probably at least close to uh, where are we at there uh, seventeen dollars so that's at least nineteen percent of the gain is just that alone not so much from the five dollar premium so in this case still carrying a double digit risk on the first right good return potential that's that's the movement that you want I mean that's a ratio I love to see two to one in the right context right I love being able to see the max return of six percent and only risking three percent or having a max return of 11%, I think, like I have in Kraft, with a max risk of negative 4%. That's really fun. That's what I'm going for. So even though you're getting a higher premium, in other words, a less volatile position that wasn't a three times or ultra ETF in this case, I wouldn't expect on a 119 stock to be selling a 125 call for 21 days and getting $5. I might expect 250 or maybe $3 on a position, which still isn't a bad return, but again, it all depends on the volatility and what's available. I just don't know if it's risk taking the double digit risk on things that can fluctuate wildly and before you know it, you might be really close to that double digit risk, even though there's higher premium available, but then that also puts you in the risk of capping the upside too much if there's a large swing one direction or the other. Think about it this way. I got this position in theory here at 92.34 three times ETF Edison here. And as this, I had the 101 put, and as the stock moved up, I said, oh, here, let me go ahead now. It's at 110. Let me sell the 115. Well, I'd still be looking okay, but you see how the ups and downs would have caused me, oh, do I roll now because I sold it too soon? Do I need to go up to the 120? Do I need to pay more to buy the 115 back and go to the 125 or the 120 further out in time because of the fast gaps? 
You know, is that that's an interesting question as well. Yeah, on the side of that, you know, Sam's going to rub it in my face. that I bought TQQ in March at 50. I'm 100% in the shares of TQQ. Yeah, you're 119, so you're doing really well. Okay. All right. So that's, uh, that's I'm not saying Sam's rubbing it in my face. He also mentioned that uh, they've changed it recently where Apple's 7%, Amazon is 6%, E-mini's NASDAQ one of, uh, futures is 5.36%, and Qualcomm is at 3%. So they've been adjusting it. Uh, Apple's 23%. Um, He's saying Google's 3% as well, okay? Okay, 